And thanks to all of you for coming along to hear about something which I find fascinating, but I think most people would struggle to place. Conversion disorder. If I could just get a show of hands in this slightly darkened room, how many people had heard of conversion disorder before they came along this evening? Okay, so that's half and that's pretty good and I guess that's why uh, many of you are here, but that still leaves many of you who haven't. And I would contend that conversion disorder is probably the most common disorder that you've never heard of. <laughs> so, it used to be all the rage, everyone had it. We used to call it hysteria, and I'll come to that a little bit later. And it was all the rage about a hundred years ago, everyone was talking about it, but nowadays you never hear about conversion disorder. But it hasn't gone away. They did a big survey of every patient that was sent to a neurologist in Scotland. And one in six of those patients had conversion disorder, which made it the single commonest condition sent to a neurologist in Scotland. Okay, that was Scotland, wild and woolly, but they did a similar study in Australia last year and found almost exactly the same numbers. It's extremely common. How come we've never heard of it? Well, that's really the topic of tonight's uh, talk, and I think the reason most of us have never heard of it, and how it has this incredibly low profile, is because we're really not sure what it is. Now this thing here is the Cahun Papyrus. This is the oldest medical document in the world. It's from uh, 2000 BC, from the Middle Kingdom of ancient Egypt. And in the gynecological section, of this papyrus, it talks about conversion disorder. Now, it talks about it in the gynecological section as a problem affecting young women. And that made a lot of sense because it does mainly affect young women. And what symptoms does it have? Well, they vary. It presents with perhaps a paralysis down one side or fits or blindness, but we know it's not a neurological problem. We know the patient hasn't had a stroke. We know their eyes still work. We know that they don't have epilepsy. And how do we know those things? Because the patient may be paralyzed, but at night when they're asleep in bed, they might still move their leg as normal. So the symptoms are strange in that sense. And we'll talk a little bit more about how people have attempted to understand that later. So it's got its most famous formulation of the olden times with this chap on the left, Hippocrates. And really that's where we owe the name hysteria. The formulation that they had was that it was a problem of the womb. And that in an abstinent young woman, the womb would detach itself from the pelvis and start to rampage around the body uh, and cause symptoms for the patient. That seems ridiculous to us today, but of course their understanding of anatomy and physiology was very different. And that view actually held sway for a very, very long time. It was the dominant view until really about the 17th century when physicians such as this chap in the middle, that's Thomas Sydenham, an English physician, thought that perhaps this might have something to do with the patient's brain or their mind. The chap on the right, is a French neurologist, arguably the greatest neurologist of all time, a man called Charcot. And he argued, well, he was famous, I should say, because he uh, discovered the neurological basis of so many neurological disorders today. And he did that by observing patients when they were alive, and then after they died, he would do a post-mortem on them and look in their brains to find which bit of their brain had suffered the damage that could explain the symptoms they'd had. Okay, and in that way he was able to explain multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease and so on. And he tried to do that with hysteria, as it was then called, and he failed. Their brains looked completely normal. Instead, he argued for what we would consider perhaps the first psychological model. He said that what they were undergoing was a form of suggestion, like a hypnosis 
the patients would adopt these symptoms uh, with a sort of idea that had taken control of them and they wouldn't let go. Now that model that he adopted was not very successful. As soon as he died, the neurologists around him gave up on it. But what's important about him is that at the time he introduced that model, it was revolutionary. Because the neurologists who had been trying to understand this, how can someone who's paralyzed and yet move their leg while they're asleep, had more or less concluded that patients were just making it up. But because Charcot said they weren't, because he threw, as Freud later put it, all the weight of his authority behind the genuineness of their symptoms, the neurological establishment had to agree that the problem was real. Now, like I say, his solution didn't survive. Freud, who was one of his neurology uh, students, was far more successful in his view. And he argued in his first major publication that what was going on was that patients had suffered some kind of traumatic experience in their life. But they hadn't processed this. They hadn't dealt with it in the normal way. They had repressed it, as he argued, and instead of it coming out as tears or anger or defiance, it then emerged as symptoms like the paralysis. Okay, now that theory was in some ways the birth of modern psychiatry and has been enormously influential. But it didn't entirely carry the day, at least not forever. The chap in the middle is a, uh, another British psychiatrist and I put him up here because he treated lots of people in the First World War. And in the First World War, there was an epidemic of hysteria called shell shock in those days. Hundreds of thousands of men, so clearly not a gynecological disease, would develop weakness, paralysis, and so on. And doctors were again confused as to what this represented. Freud, who was beginning to get into vogue then, it was about 20 years later, obviously argued that this was a subconscious process, that they were dealing with traumas, perhaps the traumas of warfare. But the doctors also knew that soldiers were very tempted under the pressures of war to malinger, to pretend that they were sick to get out of the horrors of the trenches. Again, this question was raised, what is going on? Are they pretending to be sick or not? And this chap on the right, uh, I'm crediting here with putting the nail in Freud's coffin, though I think there have been many nails over the years. That's Popper, he's a, a, a philosopher who said, well, look, this Freudian theory might be all very well, but we really can't prove it. We can't ever prove it's false, in fact, he said, and therefore it really can't be a scientific theory at all. So psychiatry reacted to that eventually, um, by getting rid of Freudian ideas, which up until that point, and uh, I'm talking about America particularly here, but America, of course, has been enormously influential. Up until uh, this time, the 60s or the 70s, Freudian ideas had completely dominated psychiatry, and, in, and in, including in hysteria or conversion disorder. But uh, the big change finally came, and they said, we need to get rid of this Freudian idea because we can't prove it's true, we can't... Uh, we can't know that these things apply. We can't know that a patient has a memory if they've repressed it, that sort of thing. And they removed Freudian criteria from all of their definitions, except from conversion disorder. It was kept in. And it was kept in until the very last edition of the American Diagnostic Manual, DSM-5, which came out uh, a couple of years ago. And finally, they got rid of this idea, which had been in there up until that point, that hysteria was this post-traumatic condition. People would have traumatic experiences, they'd repress them, and they'd convert that symptom, that memory rather, into some kind of symptom. They only got rid of that in the last model, DSM-5. Up until that point, it had been clearly in there. Was that the right thing to do? And why did they do it? Freud, after all, is a very influential person, far and away the most quoted psychologist of all time, even though he's not a psychologist. And the problem, as Popper mentioned, is that it was hard to prove it. 
People who work with conversion disorder are often struck by the fact there seems to be something to what Freud had said. People have often had troubled, traumatic lives, and those traumas often seem to be related in a way to their problems, to their symptoms. The problem is not whether Freud was right. The problem was whether you could prove he was right. It's not about the validity, as we would say in psychiatric terms, of Freud's criteria. The problem was about the reliability of it. So it's far more common these days to talk about PTSD as a post-traumatic condition. And the contrast with PTSD is very clear in this respect. In PTSD, as you all know, patients are exposed to some kind of life-threatening trauma. They're in a war or a, an explosion, a volcano. They are exposed to something uh, horrifying and they suffer with symptoms afterwards. They keep having nightmares or uh, flashbacks about the event. Now, that's very different to the kind of thing that Freud argued was the case in conversion disorder, at least in peacetime. He said that the kind of problems that people were repressing were uh, disagreements with your partner that were too difficult to talk about, perhaps sexual problems that you couldn't express. Those are very different in how we establish whether they happened. We know whether someone was blown up in the war because it's a public event. How are any of us to know whether someone has had some kind of sexual problem with their partner that they find too difficult to talk about? We simply wouldn't. And even if we did know about it, how would we know it was important? We know that the events in PTSD are important because the patient says so, right? I was in this terrible thing, it was awful, I can't stop thinking about it, I'm having nightmares about it. You've got precisely the opposite problem in conversion disorder, at least according to Freud. He says they've repressed it. They're, they're denying or at least ignoring any of its emotional impact. How could we know whether it mattered to the patient? And even if we thought it did, even if we thought, well, I think the fact that you've been unable to, let's say, express your sexual orientation publicly is important, how do we know that we're right if the patient doesn't think so? Again, in PTSD, it's clear how that would work. They can have a terrifying experience and they stay scared. How can you hypothesize even that having the kind of problem that Freud said patients have experienced would lead them to becoming paralyzed down one side or to having fits or to be blind? What's the process that could lead to that? No one has articulated what that might be. So that leaves us with the question, really, was Freud right? Or is this whole idea of hysteria, conversion disorder, being a post-traumatic condition, a red herring, or just a fanciful idea that we'll never be able to establish? And the problem uh, is made manifest when people have looked at this today. People have tried to see, well, have patients had more traumas than anyone else? Are their problems related to their traumas? And you get enormously different results depending on how you answer, ask this question. A study at the top found that trauma was no more common in patients with uh, conversion disorder than anyone else. A study at the bottom found that conversion disorder, every single patient had had a significant trauma. The difference is in how they studied it. And that makes a big difference. This is a bit of a transcript from a study that we are doing at the moment of a single case. Okay, so this is someone who's being interviewed by a psychiatrist about the things that went on in their life prior to them getting sick. There's a lot of text there, and I'm not going to read it all to you, but if you read through that, you'll find that the patient is very upset about how uh, their friend has treated them. And every time they talk about that friend, their symptoms appear. And they appear because the patient says, suddenly, I'm feeling weak, my weakness is coming up. Every time the friend is brought up, the symptoms appear. That's it there. 
How would you feel if your friend wasn't there? Oh, I'm feeling dizzy in my hand. I just feel I needed a glass of water. Leaves the room. Are you all right? Yes, I've got a weird feeling in my left hand. And then later on again, they talk about the same friend. And as soon as that your sister and your friend, oh, might start rubbing my shoulder again. I'm having weakness on my left hand. Whenever they talk about this friend, they get this symptom. Now that's good evidence, I think, that in this person, at least, thinking about this friend brings on their symptoms. They're related. The mechanism is still unclear, but for that person, it seems clear there is a connection between the memory of whatever's happened with the friend and this weakness that she has in her shoulder. Now, there are other cases like this, but clearly for some people, there is a connection. So I don't think it's wholly fanciful, but the question remains, how can we demonstrate this? How can we prove that there is this kind of connection? So I'm going to be talking about how you prove that one thing causes another, and that's a very difficult thing to do. Science always struggles with this. Medicine has always struggled with this. There's lots of different things you need to do, and those different things were listed by a famous epidemiologist, so, uh, the Bradford Hill criteria. You have to show that this connection is a strong connection, that it's consistent, it's always the same, that it's specific, that it specifically happens with that uh, antecedent. That it's in the right temporal relationship, that the cause always comes before the effect. And that there's a biological gradient, which means a stronger cause leads to a stronger effect. And it has to be plausible, it has to make sense. There's a lot of different things that you have to establish before you can say that one thing, such as a trauma, is causing another. I'm going to talk a little bit now about how we have attempted to demonstrate those things. Given that we think that in some cases it's clear that these memories cause these, the memories of these traumas lead to these symptoms, how we're going to show that that is the case for conversion disorder. And I'm not just in a single case. So we're trying to get around the problems that I talked about earlier of reliability, of identifying these events that might be so otherwise minor in how they seem or unimportant and uh, dismissed by the patient. Trying to find what the events are, trying to find out which events are important, and trying to be sure that they really are important, that they really did uh, lead to the symptoms. And in all this, we're just trying to be more objective than simply asking them what's going on, which is, of course, the usual psychiatric way. Now, the way we've approached this, trying to be more objective, has two parts. The first part is to uh, take the standard psychiatric interview, asking people what's happened to you, what's going on, what are the traumas that you've had in your life, and trying to make that more robust and more objective. And we use this uh, instrument called the Life Events and Difficulties Schedule. Okay, now that's just a very, very thorough interview. It goes over everything that could possibly have happened to you in, let's say, the year before you got sick. It could take hours to go through all of this. Our longest case, I think, was four hours. We had to interview someone to find out all of the things that had happened. You know, was there a problem with your damp in your roof, or a problem with your car, is there a problem with your pet, is there a problem? Anything uh, and everything is covered by that. But the key difference is not that it's just so thorough, it's that the person who decides about what the traumas were and whether they're important is not the patient or the interviewer, but a third party, in fact, a group of third parties. And that's the key difference. Because the patient, as we know, may be inclined to say, I don't want to talk about it, I didn't think it was important, we can just move on. They may they minim minimize uh, the significance of what happened to them. Equally, the person interviewing them may have their own ideas. They might think, yes, I, I know all about this kind of thing. 
I've seen this before, or I can feel that the patient is repressing this, it must be important, I'm really onto something, and of course they can be misled. So the people who decide are a blinded panel, so they don't know whether it's a patient or someone healthy. All they know is the, the person who interviewed them told them these are the things that happened, and then the panel makes a decision about what they think was important. And then, when we find out what those events were, we're going to bring them into the fMRI scanner. So we're going to try and get the patient to re-experience those events in the scanner and see what goes on in their brains. Uh, that's just a little bit about the reliability and whether we have truly ob achieved objectivity in this analysis, and I don't think we have, but that really is just to say that we get closer. Let me tell you about how this would work in a specific uh, real-life case. So this is, a, in some ways, a very typical case of conversion disorder. A, a young woman, as they typically are, with a typically difficult life. She had suffered terrible abuse as a child. She'd had a broken home, uh, lived on the streets, drugs of addiction. Uh, has a child of her own with whom she has a very difficult relationship. Uh, and at one point, shortly before she becomes sick, her, her daughter takes a serious overdose, which she discovers. But the kind of saving grace for this patient, the thing that held her life together, was that she'd found this partner who was a sort of rock for her and very stable, despite the chaos that she always engendered. But after 12 years, the partner finally said, I can't take it anymore, I'm leaving you. And at that point, the patient collapsed, had a fit, and was left paralyzed on the ground. Okay, so that's a canonical case of conversion disorder. Why is that conversion disorder? Because we know that it wasn't an epileptic fit, because even though she was convulsing, she was still awake and able to squeeze her partner's hand and listen to what he said and so on. And we know she wasn't really paralyzed, as though she'd had a stroke, because she was able to move her leg while she was asleep, and so on. And sure enough, when we asked her, well, your partner leaving you, that must have been a terrible thing, she said, no, it wasn't such a big deal, it was okay. But it's pretty clear, I think, to anyone hearing that story, that the partner leaving her was important. As soon as he said it, she collapsed. Not the day before, the month before, the year before, but as he said it, she collapsed, had a fit, and was left paralyzed. It clearly, in that sense, was an obvious cause. So we interviewed her about this, using the method that I described, finding about everything that had happened to her in the months before she'd got sick. And we found out about the uh, overdose of her daughter, which she discovered, which is certainly a big deal. And we found out about the breakup. And then we found out about a third thing, a sort of neutral thing, if you like, a weekend that she had spent together. Now, it's important to note that being uh, left by your partner and having your daughter commit a potentially fatal overdose are both equally bad. In the crude rating by which there's life events and difficulty schedule rates things, they're both classed as severe. They're equally bad. So we can compare them. And they happened about a month apart. Okay? They were both equally threatening, equally traumatic, you might expect. At least our panel thought so. So when we get her to re remember, recall, re-experience those things in the scanner, any differences between those two things might be informative in how her brain is working. So the way we get her to re-experience those in the scanner is we create a sort of narrative about the event in the first person. Uh, if it was about the overdose, it would start with, well, I was, came home on Friday night, um, struggled to get my key in the door. Uh, I opened the door. My daughter was lying on the kitchen floor. Uh, there wasn't a pulse. I checked her left arm and so on. All these statements. But some of these statements we've made false. We've changed them. So when we change a detail, but uh, it's a detail that the patient would have to uh, 
recall vividly in order to check whether it was right or not. So let's say I check the pulse in her left hand or her right hand. Okay, it's not the kind of thing you remember from the retelling of the story. It's the sort of thing you'd have to uh, put yourself back in the memory to find out whether, whether you'd check the left hand or the right hand. Okay, so we've changed some of these statements in this narrative. And the patient has to tell us, was it true or false? So we've created this narrative and we scanned her a few weeks later and got her to tell us whether all these statements were true or false about the breakup with her partner and about the breakup, uh, the overdose with her daughter and this weekend that they spent. And this is what we found. I'm going to be showing a number of brain scans. So this just shows different slices through the brain uh, in three different directions. In this case, this way, that way, and front to back. And what they show is a clear pattern that when they thought about the breakup with their partner, there was a real difference from what was going on in their brain from when they thought about the other two events, even though the overdose was equally severe. So there was a lot less activity in the amygdala. Sorry, there was a lot more activity in the amygdala when she thought about the breakup. A lot more activity in the right inferior frontal lobe. A lot more activity in the right inferior parietal lobe. And a lot more activity in the supplementary motor area. And a lot less activity in the motor cortex. Now, some of you may be unfamiliar with what all of those different bits of the brain do. But the motor cortex is the bit that controls in this case, her right arm and right leg, I think, left motor cortex, yeah. That's the bit that's responsible for her symptoms. She's left with this paralysis. And we've got this decreased activity in the bit of the brain that leads to those symptoms. When she thinks about the breakup, only when she thinks about the breakup, when she thinks about the divorce, there isn't this, uh, when she thinks about the overdose, there isn't this decrease in activity. But when she thinks about the breakup, there is. And there's this increase in activity in the bits that control it, in the bits that regulate emotion, the bits that control how she feels about her body. So, this is exciting. Because arguably, what it shows is that there's a specific response to thinking about the trauma which we think caused her symptoms. That every time we get her to think about it now, we're seeing the symptoms appear. This could be the objective measure of that transcript that I showed you. Every time she talks about the friend, the symptoms appear. Now, every time we get her to remember the breakup, we see signs of those symptoms and signs of change in how her brain is reacting emotionally. That's a single case again. All we need to do now is do it on a lot more people. Now, this it was very, very hard work. It took many years to do this project, but I'm pleased to say that we managed to get 42 patients, which was certainly a record at the time. There were people who had uh, symptoms of weakness as a result of their conversion disorder. And we got a group of healthy control subjects from their general practitioners. We gave everyone this life events and difficulty schedule asked them about the year before they got sick, and if they were control, we asked them about a similar time period. And then the panel decided which of these events would be important in a typical person, to a typical person in their context. And context is very important. So we're not just asking people, did you get divorced? Because a divorce can mean very, very different things depending on the context. If you're the person leaving your partner, it's very different than if you're the person being left. If you're left with money or no money, if you're left with the kids or without the kids, if you're angry, if you're happy, all of these things are obviously going to make an enormous difference to what the impact of the divorce would be. That's the context of it. So the panel decides how would somebody feel about a divorce in that context, being left 
with the kids, but no money, and a house, having been divorced for the third time, having been cheated on by the partner, but also having an affair. Whatever the details of it are, that's the context. How would someone feel, a typical person, in that context? And we also got them to decide which events were escape events. And this is critical to what I'm going to talk about next. There's all sorts of traumas that happen to people. All of us have traumatic events of this type in our lives. We all have divorces, injuries, accidents, and so on. But some events, if you get sick, the event's not so bad. Now, I mentioned shell shock at the beginning in the First World War. That would be a classic event where if you got sick, the trauma would not be so bad. The trauma in the case of the First World War is you're being blown up, or you're facing death at any moment, your friends are all dying around you, you're surrounded by trauma. If you get sick, the trauma is not so bad because you go to hospital, you're removed from the trenches. So that trauma is what we call an escape event. If you get sick, you can escape from it. Now we thought those kind of events were gonna be important in deciding who got conversion disorder. We thought those kind of events were gonna be particularly important in leading to conversion disorder. Let me give you an example. So our lady was abandoned by her partner. Okay, that was an important event. If she got sick, she might be able to hang on to her partner. She probably wouldn't, but she might. How might she? Because he might feel too guilty. She just collapsed, she's now paralyzed on one side, she's in a wheelchair, it's all my fault, it's because I said I'm gonna leave you. I can't leave you now, disabled. I'm gonna have to stick around. Something like that might happen. So those kind of events are possible escape events. Another one would be being bullied by your boss, right? You're having a terrible time, your boss is awful to you. If you get sick, you can escape from the situation. Now, if her partner had died, instead of abandoning her, it would not be an escape event. Because if she got sick, if she become paralyzed on one side, it's not gonna make the situation any better. He's not gonna stick around because he's, he's dead. It's the same event, partner leaving, but one of them is an escape event and one is not. We thought these events were gonna be important. This just tells you who we recruited and the trouble that we went to to make sure we'd got the right people. We'd got controls that looked as much as possible like our patients. And we were quite fortunate in recruiting people who were. So even though our patients had more sexual abuse in their uh, childhoods, as we would expect, our controls otherwise matched them. Same number of females, age, uh, same degree of education, same degree of physical abuse, and so on. And indeed, they both had difficult lives. So there was no difference at all in how many events the patients and the controls had had in the year before they got sick. They all had difficult lives, full of hardship and traumas. Okay? No difference between the patients and controls. Even when you look at severe events, things like a divorce or your daughter taking an overdose, there's no difference between the number of severe events that our patients and our controls had in the year before they got sick. But when we looked at those escape events that I talked about, the difference is clearly very statistically significant. Our patients have far more of these escape events in the year before they get sick than controls. And that difference only gets stronger the closer you get to them becoming sick. So that's, these are events in the year before they get sick, that's in the three months before they got sick, that's in the one month before they got sick. I could go on and on into the day or hours before they got sick. There's a clear difference, even though the controls are having a lot of difficulties in their lives, it's only our patients who are having these escape events, and they're having more and more of them 
close to the time they get sick. Now, if you just remember what we were trying to show by this, we're trying to show that these events are causing, these traumas are causing them to get sick. So, arguably, if you accept the results of this study, it's only one study, but if it's right, we've shown that's a pretty strong relationship. And it's obviously in the right temporal direction. All of these traumas happened before the patients got sick. We've still got to show an awful lot of things, though. We have to show that it's consistent. We have to show that it's specific, meaning this doesn't exactly the same thing doesn't happen in depression or schizophrenia or any other uh, mental health problem, for example. That it's plausible and that there's this biological gradient. Well, let me talk about specificity. So we've done the same thing with depression. Got a group of depressed controls, people who also, as we know, have lots of difficulties in their lives. That's one of the reasons people get depressed, because they have terrible things happen and they become depressed afterwards. So maybe they're also having lots of these escape events. Our, our matched group do the same thing, the life events and difficulties schedule on them, find out about their events, and sure enough, this column here is conversion disorder, this is depression, and as you can see in the 12 months before, they're both having lots of events, and there's no difference between how many events they're having. When we look at these in the three months, and the preceding one month, we can see the difference just gets stronger and stronger, and it's particularly strong when we look at these escape events. Okay? Patients with depression have lots of traumas in the year or the time before they get sick, but with conversion disorder, it's right before they get sick, and it's particularly these escape events. They do happen, of course, with other conditions. People with depression have some. People with depression get divorced and have bullying bosses just like everyone else. But the ratio is extremely strong for conversion disorder. It's far more common in conversion disorder than depression, that people have these escape events just before they get sick. That's specificity. It's not only happening in conversion disorder, where it's far more commonly a problem in conversion disorder than in other mental health problems. Well, let's talk about that last one now, plausibility. And this is where we come back to our fMRI. How could having one of these events make you paralyzed? How could it lead to these symptoms? So the, the scanning uh, paradigm that I described earlier, we repeated in a group of these patients. Why didn't we scan all of them? because they needed to have been unlucky enough not to have had just one really awful thing happen to them, but two equally awful things happen to them in the year before they got sick. Not everyone has that, even our unfortunate patients and our unfortunately uh, troubled controls. 15 patients did, however, and 12 controls have two equally bad things happen to them in the year before they got sick. So just as with the case I presented, we can compare those and see what's the difference between the thing that we think caused you to get sick, the escape event, and the other equally bad thing. Is there a difference in how your brain responds to those? So these are people with what we think is the key event, the escape event, something equally bad, and a third neutral event. Again, we put them in the brain scanner, so we can see what's happening in their brains when they answer these questions, tell us whether they're true or false. This just shows you what the patient would have seen. They'd have first seen a, a slide like this when they're lying in the scanner. It's going to tell you the next eight questions are going to be about your daughter's overdose. And then you'd see a series of slides that would say something like, I heard Sam crying in the kitchen, and you have to decide, is that true or false, and press a button. And this is what we found. So, a complicated slide here. But again, we're looking at slices through the brain at the bottom. This is looking uh, horizontally, as it were, at the top. We're looking at 
what you might think of as vertical slices through the brain. And it's a very similar pattern to what we saw in that case. So there is greater activity when they think about the event which we think caused them to get sick, and only that event, and only in the patients, not in the healthy controls. In the bits of the brain that control movement and bodily awareness, and a decrease in activity in those bits of the brain responsible for memory, the hippocampus. So there's a suppression of the memory when they think about this and an increase in motor activity, meaning control of movement. When we looked more closely at specific bits of the brain, the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, a bit right here, again we find the same pattern. There's much more activity when patients think about the escape events than when we think about the equally bad event, and there's no difference when the controls think about the escape events or the other events. It's specific to patients, and it's specific to thinking about these escape events. There's this greater activity in the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Now, that may be gobbledygook to some of you, but let me tell you what that could mean, and there's many interpretations. If you try and suppress a memory, if you try and not think about the elephant in the room, whatever that may be. If I tell you, don't think about the word banana. The way you do that is you activate the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in order to suppress your hippocampus. So maybe what Freud said about patients repressing these memories deliberately, which is what he said, is right. When they think about these escape events, Maybe that's what they're doing, suppressing these memories. And at the same time that they're doing that, we're having this change in motor activity, in control over their bodily responses that's specific to when they think about these traumatic events. There were other changes as well. The right inferior frontal cortex that we previously mentioned, a big memory, uh, a big sort of... Uh, emotion control and uh, control area of the brain, generally inhibited in patients whenever they think of anything. And moreover, there's a much stronger connection in our patients between the amygdala, the sort of primary emotion area, and the supplementary motor area, the motor control area. There's a big, strong connection between these two things in our patients, whatever they think about, and in controls there really isn't. So, what could that mean? Well, I've said it could mean that they're suppressing memories, and it could mean that the, at the same time they're suppressing these memories, symptoms are arising. In Freud's parlance, that they're repressing these symptoms, and uh, the memories, and converting them into symptoms. And at the same time, it could be that their ability to manage their emotions is far less uh, effective than in healthy people and there's this abnormal connection between their feelings and their motor activity how they how they move and control their bodies than there is in normal people whenever they're thinking about things so maybe they were always vulnerable to having this kind of problem in the first place because of this connection and because they don't control their emotions in the same way but it takes a specific trigger this traumatic event to produce the symptoms. That's one possible interpretation. It's the one that I favor. Uh, we'll need to do far more studies to demonstrate that. But it's clear that certain events are far more common in conversion disorder and preceding the onset of conversion disorder than in healthy controls or people with depression. And they have a different response to these, consistent with their symptoms and a different response to having stress in general. Now, the numbers are pretty small still, particularly in the scanning part of this, and this needs to be replicated in a far larger group and by someone else, ideally, so that it doesn't just look like it's me making this all up. <laughs> <laughs>
It may not apply to everyone. It doesn't apply to everyone. We didn't find traumatic events in all of our patients. That's important to acknowledge. We found it in the majority. So this may only be for some patients with conversion disorder. Identifying these kind of life events is a dirty, difficult, painful business, and I'm sure we don't get it right. The panel's deciding how would a typical person react to a divorce under those circumstances, but you know, it's always going to be different for everyone depending on what they've been through before, and no interview is going to capture all of that. Our explanations are never going to be perfect, and sometimes we know we miss things. One memorable case was a patient came up uh, after the study was finished and said, you know, I never did tell you about that other thing because um, it was too embarrassing or something like that. Those, those kind of things are always possible. It doesn't answer the question that uh, was asked 100 years ago of whether these patients are pretending because all of this is, is overt. The stimuli and the responses are all conscious and deliberate, so... People could be pretending to give these responses if, I don't know why on earth anyone would want to do that, uh, but they, they might. So, we are working towards an explanation for conversion disorder as a post-traumatic condition, much like post-traumatic stress disorder. That patients have traumas, and when they remember these traumas, they have symptoms. The events are strongly linked in the right direction, they're relatively specific, and hopefully there's something plausible in what I've said, even if I've not shown ultimately that we have caused uh, their symptoms. Okay, thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be delighted to take any questions you might have.